things that are going to be in So basically, how to the dealers. We're going to get started. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to we're going to get started all right so this evening we're going to talk about concurrency so if you're not sure what that means you're in the right class uh, where you go there it is if you do know what it is, you shouldn't be here. That's also true. And you could skip. <laughs> so, so it is my, it is my impression that you all feel that you're ending the the semester soon. Is that correct? <laughs> you're either burning out or highly anticipating leaving UMBC for a little while, which is good because that's where our schedule is. So. I have, uh, let's see. It's, yes. Yeah, it's, 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 yes. <laughs> so next week is Thanksgiving on Thursday, which is a holiday. But on Wednesday, we are holding class. So I think you would build your social reputation with the fellow students. <laughs> no. I'm gonna have too much turkey, so I can't really like take more turkey. <laughs> All right. So, so basically, what we're gonna walk away with tonight is the ability to measure the resources you're using, and use the resources you use you have more effectively. So hopefully that should sound a little enticing. Um, if you if you've never done anything more than like Python, you've always, that means you've always been using one processor. But your computer has many processors, usually at least two, four, or eight on your desktop. Which means, I mean, get this, you could speed up your work by a factor of two or four or eight for free, right? You already own the computer. And so it means you could go eight times faster for no extra money. That should sound interesting, hopefully. All right, and if you don't know how many processors your computer has, we will find that out tonight. All right, that's pretty exciting. All right, <laughs> so the first thing that we're going to start off with is basically measuring how long it takes to do things. Because if you don't know how long it takes to do things, then you can't observe the improvement that you get by making them faster. All right. All right, so <laughs> there's a lot of good things about Python. It's super easy to learn, hopefully. You've learned that over the semester. <laughs> no? <laughs> OK, that was a joke. <laughs> and so, but it turns out that Python isn't always the right language to use. And so we're going to get into cost, a, a discussion about like when to switch um, programming environments and algorithms. And so that's, that's a messy subjective topic. But let's we'll start out with some timing. So the idea, so profiling, <laughs> when I mean it, I don't mean in like the police pulling you over sense. I mean like measuring how long it takes to run your code. And the idea here is not just to measure how long it takes to run code, but typically not all lines in your program take the same amount of time to execute. So these are what are called hot spots. And so what you really want to do in this effort is to identify where is the most time being spent in my code. Because what that allows you to do is figure out, I don't want to optimize all my code. I want to find the spot that's taking the most time and then spend most of my effort and focus on that few lines of code. So that's what we want to do. All right, I'm going to spend a little bit of time going through what are called cell magics for Python. And so we've already seen a few of these. They're just things that start with a percent sign. The danger in like being aware of these things is that they're only applicable in Jupyter. So they're not things that translate to Python or any other language. So there's a little bit of like a a warning there, but they're worth sort of understanding because the concepts that cell magics present are applicable in every language. So there's profilers for every language um, that I know of. Uh, and so these concepts are specific to Jupyter, but the idea applies in anything. All right. Let's make this a little bigger. So I'm going to. Yes. OK, so this is basically like a crash course in all the different things you can do with cell magics for profiling. So this, all these notebooks obviously will be posted in Blackboard, but 
Um, I'm just going to cruise through a few examples here. I've already got them up. OK. Oops. So I've got two functions. One is just sort of like a function that gets called by this other function. So the multiply function is just called from this one. And you'll see why I do that in a moment. And then this one primes. It's You can ignore the content. Just keep in mind that it's a thing that requires a lot of computation. And so typically, you don't profile a code that's only three lines long and does print statements. You profile something, you, you invest effort in trying to make something more efficient if it's taking a long time or a lot of resources. So this is just a small snippet of code that is irrelevant other than to say it takes a long time. Okay, so let's actually just run this quick. Get that running. And so the, the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna call the function. So I've got the, the function is called primes. I'm gonna pass it the number 20. And then once that runs, I think it will return the number, or it'll return all the prime values up to 20. And then the trick here is the time will tell you how long it took to do that one line. So this would be the case where like if you already knew what line you cared about in your Python code, you just time that line. So not too surprising there. And it returns this thing, little mu here. This is a, a Greek letter. So if you're not familiar with Greek, welcome to Greek. <laughs> All right. So I always get confused. Um, don't feel bad. I'm a physicist. Um, and so I have to look up this metric prefix list. And basically, this tells you all the different sort of abbreviations. All they're really doing is they're just hiding the fact that this is either you know, 10 to the negative third in scientific notation, which is 0 0.001. Right? All these different prefixes, they're just factors of 1,000 smaller and smaller. So mu, which is the one down here, is 10 to the negative six, which means it's a millionth of a second. So let's look back at our code. That means 0.77.5 millionths of a second to run the first 20 primes. I know you couldn't be faster than that, but that's that's pretty cool, right? So we timed it. OK, so now if we go off, we can time a whole cell rather than just a single line. So now I've got two calls to the same function. It took slightly longer. Not Well, actually shorter. That's funny. <laughs> All right. If that is consistent, yeah. So now we reran it. This was, now it's shorter because we put things in cache. That's a little side note. Where am I going to get stuck on? Does it automatically scale it to the length so it wouldn't give you fractions, microsecond fractions of your second? I'm not sure what you're asking. What do you mean? So um, if this took a lot longer, yes. Give it give you the 90 it, seconds. Yes. Okay. Yes. We'll see that, which is a great question. I didn't plant that question. It's coming up, though, in the next cell. Let's see. So right, one trick is that I don't want to actually print everything, because printing itself takes time. And so you typically want to store whatever would get printed to a variable. So this is just showing that it's, uh, oh, that's weird. Yeah, so <laughs> there it's taking a little less time, hopefully, with Starting to variable. And so here to answer your question, it says milliseconds. So that it's, it's automatically rescaling the, the value. OK. So again, and then the last little small trick is that you can do a run multiple times and then like figure out what the deviation, the standard deviation is for those multiple runs. So that's, that may or may not be useful. All right, so these are all sort of like little tricks that if you already know where you're looking. Where? Right, so this was the, so they did multiple runs, I think seven runs. And then it said the average value is 483 milliseconds. But it saw things, uh, so basically, let's drop that. It basically looked at values. So maybe this is your time, and you had like one run that, that took I don't know, 400 milliseconds. And then you had another run that took a little less, maybe like 300, and another one that took 500. And then you had another run that was like 350. So you take seven of these things, and you say this, the mean value is this one. And then the standard deviation is like some distance here. That's how far apart that spread is. So ideally, you want things that are close to the mean. 
means everything is consistently timed. If you had a wide variation in how what, what your times were, there's a lot of variation every time that you run the same code. Okay. All right. So this first one isn't going to make much sense. So I'm running a thing called C profile. It would make more sense in the context where I had a bunch of functions calling each other. Because the thing it's looking at is how much time was spent per function call. And for the function that we have up here, almost all the function calls are things internal to Python. So for instance, we have the range command. That's an internal command in Python. So what we're really looking at here from C profile is a lot of the internal functions. So here's like multi by and like, uh, yeah, just got a bunch of things that I don't care about, other than the fact that one of these things is prime. So that's the, the one function call that I make. It's timing how long it took to do that. But if I had a bunch of functions, it would look across all those different ones and tell you which functions were taking the most time. So this outputs a big giant table with all these different columns, and you can say like cumulative time and total time and it's per function. That'd be a, for applicable to a very fun, a very complicated code calls. But something that's slightly more interesting, this thing called line profiler. All right, so line profiler is pretty crazy. You take a function and you break it out line by line and you say which of those lines took the most time. So that's cool, right? So that means I can time, I'm, I'm gonna call this program and I'm specifically interested in the line profile of the function primes. So again, if I had a bunch of functions calling functions, but I only cared about one of them, this is where I would pick out that one function. How would I know which function was spending the most time in my program? I just ran a C profile. Right. So there I've got, I can figure out which function is taking the most time in a complicated workflow. Then once I know that, I can identify within a function which lines are taking the most time. So that's that's how you drill down into your code to figure out where your hotspots are. And then, yeah, I think that's, it's not as exciting to look at multiply because there's just like, it's a function, it's a function with like three lines of code. So nothing exciting there. They're all roughly the same. Okay, yeah, I think that's it. So, I think I'll get to this later in the class, but I wanted to ask you guys, why would I profile code in the first place, like, other than me assigning it as a homework assignment? <laughs> Does anyone have any ideas about why we would do that? Okay, why, so good, you wanna, op so profiling is driven by the need to optimize. Why do we wanna optimize? All right, so taking less time, so that's, that's like a very easy one. The other thing is if you're looking at resources on your computer, you maybe want to optimize not only for time, which is you waiting to go get coffee and coming back and your computer still isn't finished, right? Or you might want to optimize for like memory use. If your computer only has four gigabytes of RAM, but the program you write needs 500, then you're gonna to have to optimize how your memory profile works out. Or if you don't have disk space and you have to do everything on disk, Right, you have to optimize for that. So there's lots of different things to optimize for. The most common one is time, so that's why we're spending time with that. Okay. Oh yeah, so I should say, <laughs> I, have, I have personally don't use time or time it very much because uh, a lot of my code, I have to transition back and forth between like a Python notebook and a Python like script file, right, .py. And so these cell magics only work in Jupyter and so when I write a lot of code, you'll see like, you know, the start time equals time that time, and then the lap time equals like something else. And so I'm doing that within a cell. And so you'd say like, Ben, why not be lazy and use one of these cell magics? I'm just, I'm in the habit of not using cell magics. That's not to say you shouldn't use them. They're perfectly. Not, well, the cell magics are specific to Jupyter. And so if you leave the Jupyter environment, they won't be available. Is that what you're asking? Like what? Like a Python script? Yeah, Python script doesn't use Jupyter, and so you, like, right? The, the model of execution is Jupyter calls Python for each of its cells, but you can separately run Python as a standalone application without using Jupyter, in which case these cell magics, they're just, they're commented out and you don't see them anymore. 
All right, I'm going to do one more thing that's not in my script, so maybe it will not work, but we'll try it out. OK, so the what I've just showed you is all the things within Jupyter timing cells, lines, functions, right? Things that sound um, great, but then you realize, how do I actually time how long it takes to run a notebook? Right, so I, I want to time all the cells. And so one way to do that would be like start a timer at the top of the notebook, put a timer at the bottom of the notebook, right? But it, if you had to do that for, say, 25 student notebooks that you're grading, you wouldn't want to do that, right? So I'm going to show. Huh? <laughs> so there's this cool trick where um, in your shell environment, so outside of Jupyter, you can run a command that will run the Jupyter notebook for you. So <laughs> exactly. So, so the, the, the syntax here is basically ignore the, the first game time. So Jupyter NB convert. And so you're playing this trick on Jupyter because it has this feature where it can convert your notebook into either a Python script or a PDF or an HTML file or a notebook. And so if you convert your notebook to a notebook and say execute that meanwhile, right, it will actually execute the notebook in place right, using Python 3. And then we can preface all of that, basically executing a notebook, with the command time. So for you Linux and Mac users, there's a command called time which will tell you how long it took to run a command. This command being, execute the notebook. Okay, so for Windows users, you're probably in PowerShell. I don't have PowerShell, but I think this is the case, that you would use the command called measure command, and you just run measure command, and then the Jupyter notebook command, and it would measure how long that took. Okay, so here's the funny part. I've got a notebook called timingnotebooks.ipynb. I'm gonna time how long it takes to do this notebook execution. Right, so you now I'm, I'm lazy, so I'm just going to write uh, time.sleep, five seconds. Right, so I'm going <laughs> to, this is a pretty exciting notebook. I import time, and then I start a stopwatch, and I say, how long does it take to sleep for five seconds? 5.1 seconds. Okay, so close enough, right? <laughs> We're done. All right, so now let's go over to a terminal. So this is, uh, again, this will vary depending on what your environment looks like. I'm going to save this. I'm going to CD over to this directory. And then I'm going to time how long it takes to execute this notebook. OK, so it's converting the notebook to a notebook, and then it's executing that notebook with Python 3. And then as you'd expect, it takes at least five seconds, but this one took a lot longer. So 11.9 uh, seconds is the wall clock time, how long it took to elapse. Just so out of curiosity, I'm going to run it a second time and see if it still takes that long. Yeah, so I think like in the background, Jupyter has to start up a Python kernel. So like every time you open up a new notebook, it's starting a new Python instance. And so here, you're really timing how long it took to not just run the code in your notebook, but to do the startup of starting the Python environment. So there's a little bit of extra overhead. On a long notebook, like let's say your notebook took five minutes, this extra overhead wouldn't take that. It wouldn't be that as noticeable, right? Because it'd be a smaller percentage. But here, since our notebook only takes five seconds, that it's very noticeable. OK, so that's some trickery if you wanted to go off and look at how long it took to run. The other cool thing is if we look back at this notebook, um, I can close it, and I can reopen it. It actually reruns the entire notebook. So this is now oh, not too exciting. It's 5.1 seconds. I can clear the output. Eventually. All right, save that. So to actually go off, and when it reruns the notebook, the thing that's now saved to disk is the ran notebook. If that makes sense. All right, now I'll open it up, and it will actually have a time in there, so 4.98 seconds. So I, I, I closed the notebook, ran it from the command shell, opened the notebook back up, and it had been executed. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> Python is odd, yes. Okay, questions on that? 
now you can run notebooks from the command line. So that means if you had, so another use case for this is if you had 10 notebooks where they're sequen sequentially being executed, you could run all of them from the command line rather than opening them up one by one. Or you could convert a whole series of notebooks to Python script. I don't know that. All right, so that, none of this has been so far, so now I want to excite you. All right, so the, the challenge that I was given, so I was, I was, my girlfriend's in the medical community and sometimes I fly with her to go to meetings and talk to people. Um, and so this was, this notebook is from that experience where um, I, I drop into this lab and uh, a person that I'm talking to in the lab says, Ben, I've got this huge Python code and it's taking too long. I'm like, great. I could probably look at that because I'm not doing anything else today. I'm just sitting around. So uh, this is my fun story. So I've got basically a, a block of code that I have identified, which takes a really long amount of time. I literally don't know what it does. Right? I have no idea. So this is like me taking a stab and seeing if I can take some arbitrary Python and make it faster. This is a fun little test. So although I don't know what it does, I do have some idea that it takes an input. And so it takes. Uh, basically a list, the thing that's relevant is it takes a list and then uh, it takes a long time to execute something against that list. And not surprisingly, it's got a bunch of nested for loops. Right? So nested for loops should always like send your brain on high alert as far as optimization goes, because it means that this inner lo innermost loop is being executed every single time that there's a loop iteration there. And that whole thing is being executed every time this one is being executed. Right? So you've got a lot of things going on. And so that's like, most commonly going to be the hotspot in your code is these nested for loops. Now, adding things to arrays, that's a very quick operation. So even though this is the innermost for loop, I don't actually expect there to be much optimization available. Right? It's pretty straightforward. Um, so it's probably going to be up here or down here, like some, somewhere else. Maybe there's a potential speed up. Now, the problem this guy was facing was he had this code, and it would take something like more than a year to run against one data set, and he had thousands of data sets. So this clearly was not going to work out well for him. All right. <laughs> so the first thing I turned to is like profiling, right? Like how do we figure out where the hotspot is? OK, so oh, that, by the way, I just skipped over past all the help stuff. So basically, if you have a cell magic that you know of and you want to know how does it work, just ask a question mark afterwards. OK, so I'm skipping over all that documentation. So I'm going to see, uh, basically, like the first question is, which function is the hotspot? Well, it's the, in this case, the only function being called. So not too much excitement here. But basically, you can see I'm setting up an array. And then I'm going to send that array to the function. I'm going to ask, how long does it take to run? So all right, nothing exciting there. Now we get to line profiling. Live profiling is a little bit more exciting, because it actually shows you, for every line in that function, what is the amount of time it took? Right? That's the, the, the columns. So let's pick on one of those columns to focus on. So obviously, the things in the comment cell, that, that doesn't get timed. So we can look at percent time or just sort of time uh, measured in seconds. So, so here's like this one line took almost 13% of the time. So that's pretty significant compared to, like say, this thing we're just initializing an array didn't take very long. So don't worry about that, right? So there's nothing to be optimized here. It takes very little percentage of the time. Down here, this one takes 20%. So we've got a few outliers here. And as we sort of expected, this innermost for loop, even though it gets executed the most times, there's not that much actual math going on. And so it doesn't take very long to run. So we can hang out in either this area or we can hang out in this area as far as focusing our attention. All right, so, sorry? The other columns? So the other columns are number of hits. So how many times was the line visited? The time, and then the, I think, actually, I think I have this broken down. No. Sorry. I thought I had, uh, maybe it was in the last one. But there are definitions for each of these columns. So I don't have them here. OK, yeah, so number of hits. So you should expect some sort of correlation between the number of times that the line was visited and the percentage of time being spent there. OK. So 
let's see. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> the other sort of thing that I do that you'll recognize from the homework you just did, um, I was trying to figure out what is it scale like. So this was the profiling for one input with uh, an array of size 100. Or Sorry. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's a very small array, and it runs, and that's cool. But what I wanted to care about was to figure out how does it grow as a function of time. So uh, here, basically, I ran in two nested loops. So I've got the array size is incrementing, and then I have three tests that it's doing in each array size. And then I, let's see, where is it right here? So I measure how long this one line takes to run. Right? So I've got the start times and elapsed time, and then I store that into a dictionary. And then my values per loop size are being printed out here. This is the same thing you just did for your homework. So in the end, what I get is this nice fancy plot. So I can sort of understand what the trend is. And so I can extrapolate out. Like he didn't actually spend a year take like running this function for one data set. He extrapolated out from a few initial data points. So I didn't trust what he had done. And so I did it myself. And like I always try and make sure that what the person's saying is worth investing in, right? Because like yes, the the program takes a while to run. But how long would it take to run if your input was way larger? Right? And so this is a quick answer to that. Um, so if I made my array size uh, 10,000, it would take 200 seconds, which doesn't sound that bad. But if you stay on this curve and you go up to a million, it's going to take a long time. OK, so that's one thing just to verify, is this worth investing in? If I know the input size is going to be a million, then I can say yes. The other, th the other motive to do some extrapolation is to figure out when I do make a change and the code gets faster, does that faster make a big difference, right, for the scale that I'm interested in? Because, like, if I made it twice as fast, now I've gone from a year to six months. I didn't actually win, right? So I need to figure out what was the actual improvement. Faster is not a good enough qualification. Okay, so how did I, how did I make that pretty plot? Right? So I can hear you asking already. So, <laughs> So we've got the time for a given input array size, how long it took to run that function. And so you can see for 2,000, uh, an array of size 2,000, it's like eight seconds. That's quite a while. Um, so then I look at the, basically, I, I take the data points of how large was the array and how much time on average did it take for each of those iterations. And I do a NumPy polyfit. So this is a polynomial that we're fitting to the, the data points. And what I get back from the polyfit are the coefficients for a second order polynomial. So that curve here is the second order polynomial, it's like ax squared plus bx plus c. And then that was my guess based on the data points that I had, and that turned out to be a good fit. Okay. So this is my baseline. All right. So I have we talked about list comprehensions yet? Are we comfortable with list comprehensions? Mm, I got mm, a couple of head nods. All right, so so if you look at the original function up here, up uh, here, how that good? All right, so there is a for loop here. I think it's this one that I'm just incrementing over all of the elements of an array, and I'm sort of like resetting uh, to list. So I'm setting these lists. I'm basically updating all the values for all of the elements uh, in the list. So that's that's a really simple loop. So the question is, could I make the code faster by swapping out this loop with a list comprehension? I don't know. I was pretty lazy. I'll try that. Like, <laughs> I knew that's where most of the time was being spent. Right? So we look down here. This for loop, where it's just iterating all over, over all those values, that's where a lot of time is being spent. So that seems like a reasonable investment. I'm, I can convert a simple for loop into a list comprehension, which maybe it's faster. So then let's try that out. All right, so here's, here's the change. I've got the original for loop commented out, and I've replaced it with this list comprehension. So that's cool. All right. So now we go off, and we basically rerun the line profiling to see, did anything change? So still, after we have all that, there's a 1.5% of my time is being spent in that list in that list comprehension. And this other part is also sort of in the 2%, 10% range. So 
maybe that was helpful. Right? We have some hope maybe that things got better. All right, so I'm going to go back to my scaling example of how does how did the change impact the scaling? Um, and so if you remember, for 2000, I had like eight seconds, and now I have 8.5, so I actually got a little worse. <laughs> kind of weird. Um, and so I can overlay these two plots. All right, so in this case, it got a little bit worse, which is kind of a weird thing, but the orange curve is the original, and the red curve is the new change with the lamp with the list comprehension. So it actually got worse, but small change. So that's not going to pay off. <laughs> now we're going to do something else. Okay. So I did verify that the the output name, so I felt better. But so then I sort of stumbled into this Numba library. So Numba, what does it do? It takes your Python code, which is dynamically read to line by line and executed and converts it into machine code, making it an executable. So that's like some fancy magic that I'm, I don't know much about. But the fun thing about Numba is you take your original code, all this stuff, and you put what's called a decorator on it. So a decorator is a thing that sits on top of a function and has a, start, always starts with a at symbol. So the list comprehension basically tells Python, hey, the rest of this function should be treated differently. And here's how it should be treated differently. So this specific decorator from the number library is calling a just-in-time JIT compiler. So it's going to take your Python code and convert it into a binary, which runs way faster. And you can ask, well, how much faster do we get? Oh, well, I'm glad you asked. Okay, so un un unblemished code. It's the same code. All we've done is literally add one line to the top of the code. That's cool. All right, so. Let's now take that same sort of timing approach to measure the different sizes. And you'll notice here, I'm going up from 100, not up to 2,000, but uh, a million. Is that right? Let's see. No, 100,000. So I'm going up to 100,000. And you're like, Ben, that will take a really long time to execute. What? Uh, actually, it'll take 22 seconds. So that's significant. I don't, I'm sorry. I still don't understand what the Okay, it takes your, so normal. Normally, the way Python gets executed is line by line. And so it has to take this line, send it off to the interpreter, send it to the computer, get the results back, go to the next line. Send that to the interpreter, go back to the, to the CPU and memory and all that good stuff. Whereas the binary, um, it's taking it and putting it into the native machine code language for your computer and then putting that on the CPU. So the advantage is it can, so when you compile uh, something that has a bunch of for loops in it. The compiler often can recognize, hey, that's a for loop. I know how to make that really fast. And so there's lots of tricks that compilers do to make code faster that Python doesn't get to take advantage of. And so when you're doing it line by line, there's not much optimization room for you to take advantage of. But once you've compiled it, then the compiler can recognize all these sort of features in your code and make it faster for you. It's a very superficial example, but all right, so here, now we have a different plot where we have, we're going up much higher in, in the size of the input and we're taking much less time. So that's good. Okay, so let's put it on the line. Huh? <laughs> what a coincidence. <laughs> All right, so now this is the, the original two plots that I had uh, with the unmodified code and this is with number. So. It got better, right? So better means you can put in a larger input and take less time. Uh, I don't have a quick answer for that. It's a um, st pretty standard abbreviation. No, yeah, it's often used in logistics. So. I I don't have a quick answer. So this is. So just in time often in logistics refers to like delivery, not having a bunch of back inventory stuff, but for compilers there's a specific meaning. So I'll leave, leave that as a link later elsewhere. Okay, so I think that's all I had for number right. So basically we got his program down to take eight second eight days rather rather than a year. So I call that a success. I was super happy. And it took like a few hours. This is my notebook. Oh, your notebook? But, but the code is not mine. 
Yeah, that, that big function up at top, that's something that was written by someone else, and I don't, still don't understand. I don't care. I mean, like, in some sense, I don't care what it is, right? Like, that's cool. Some some academic paper. Uh, so I, I think it's not going to optimize everything. Like, I, I would be interested. Like, you can you could throw it against the homework that you did and see if it helps or not. I'm not sure that it will. It's not, I don't have a quick answer for that one. Why Why a just-in-time compiler sometimes helps and does not? Probably the number website has a documentation on that one. All right, so I promised you that we would, so all the things we've talked about run on a single program on a single computer, it's very simple, right? So let's, let's now get faster, right? So I'm gonna introduce a little bit of jargon. The jargon is parallel versus concurrent. So concurrent means things are happening at the same time, but they're not interacting. So if, if I have students talking in the back row and Ben's talking up front, they're concurrently talking. <laughs> but <laughs> so if people are talking in parallel, that means they're talking at the same time and interacting. Right, so that, that's the, I'm going to be very specific about that. I'm only going to take you on a tour of concurrent operations because they're way easier. Trying to coordinate multiple things going on at the same time, which is what parallelism is, is way hard. So I'm going to stick with the easy case. So the good news for you is almost everything you do in data science will be able to take advantage of concurrency, which is the easy thing and gets you the fast. Very rarely will you have to dive into something where you have to write an actual parallel program. Okay. All right. So as I advertised, you can already speed up your code with the hardware you have, paying no extra cost other than the thinking part and the coding part. So that's the part that takes a little bit of effort. Okay, so my question for you is, on your computer, how many processor cores do you have? So I'm gonna go through a little bit of details here. So task manager, if you're in Windows. If you're with an old version of Windows, you'll probably see something like this. I found uh, seven different ways to find this thing. Uh, and if you're, if, if you're in Windows, I'm going to wander around and, and figure out who's on, who needs help on Windows. For Mac, it's called Task uh, Activity Monitor. And then once you're in Activity Monitor, which is this window, you'll want to open up Window CPU History, and that'll actually show you a chart of how each of your cores are being used. Okay, so I'm going to walk around and see how people are, are finding these things. Right, so if you're here, in this one, you'll want to open up Open Resource Monitor. Yep. Activity monitor. So here, if you go to Launcher, I think, uh, activi try typing Activity. Yep, that one. Yep. Uh, yes. So you've got two cores there, right? OK. So here, you'll want to open up Resource Monitor. That'll actually show you the cores. If you're going to open up Resource Monitor, yeah, Resource Monitor. Yep. You got it? No? OK, so a launcher. And type activity or ACT. That one. Yep. OK, uh, who else? Who has not got it so far? Going to open up Resource Manager. Yeah. No, just open resource manager. That's the one that you had. No, it doesn't show you the multiple cores. It only shows you the average use. I don't have an answer for that one. And you'll, yeah, so you got that. Okay. Logical process for. There, yeah. It's showing over here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then, yeah, if here you go to window. And then CPU history. Yeah. Okay. So question is, does anyone have two cores? One, two, three. How many cores do you have? Okay. So who here has four? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
And for those of you who have more than two or four, how many do you have? Eight. Who has had six? Six. Six. Okay. Interesting. All right. So, so what what this means to you practically is that this is how much speed up you could get by having a concurrent implementation of your code. So basically, it means you can run two things at once, or you can run four things at once, or eight things at once, or six. All right. So that's the idea. All right. All right. So now I've got a more challenge for you. So let's count off. Let's see, there's like, this, um, I think there's the 12. Right. So remember your number. So if you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Well, that was really off. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so if you were a 12, be a, uh, was it 10? 10? We have 22, right? Yeah, so. 20. 8 plus 12, yeah. So then. <laughs> All right. So then the 11 should go with 11 with 12 and 9 with 10. Is that right? Huh? 11 and 12? <laughs> I, went, I counted the 12 and then the 8. So 11 and 12 should work together and eight and, and 9 and 10. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully we've confused everyone, yeah? Math. How does math work? I'm going to wander around if you have like if you're lost or have questions let me know. I used to work in IT. Well, so, so here you're just, this is like the utilization per core of your CPU. But what I'm going to ask up here is what percentage of your CPU. So this, this handy dandy chart here is this is the average utilization across all of your cores together. This is per core. So what you're saying is I have four cores in my, in my yes. computer then? Yes, zero but, through four. So for this here core, it says two. So... That's so you can you can have so you can have a, a socket which is like a physical device and then you can have cores within your socket and then you can have hyper threading and so it's probably using hyper threading as a logical processor so you have four hyper threaded uh, 
processors available, even though you have two cores and one socket. I don't know how many cores are there, but like in Ubuntu, it's just showing the CPU. Yeah, so you have yeah, eight, CP, eight, eight cores. Okay. I don't know how many sockets. You probably have one socket and probably actually four cores, and each one of them is hyper-threaded, so you'd have eight processors. Yes. Okay. They're just a thousand different. That's, that's the average usage, yeah. Yeah. Those other ones over on the side are per socket or per core or whatever. Right. So if you look at window, so how do you go to a window? CPU history. Can you? Yeah, there you go. You have four. You guys are done. Happy. So, how much? What is your average CPU utilization? That's this plot right here. Yeah. And then for your disk, that's memory. Mm, I doubt that. Uh, that's probably the read-write activities. So, open. I'm gonna open up Explorer here for you. Go to this computer, this PC. So you're using 90 megabytes, 90 gigabytes. Yeah, less than half, 40 percent. How much traffic over your network do you have? Yeah, have nothing. That's normal. It's not transmitting data to a server, and it's not receiving data from a server. Sure. Browse a big web. Watch a YouTube video. Question. Wi-Fi, right? Yeah, that's network. Yeah. yeah. Do you know how to get your disk? So this is not your utilization. This is like your read-write activity. So if you open up, uh, go to my computer. All right, so this is how much you're using. OK. So now we'll take a survey. So the question is, who here is using uh, less than 10% of their CPU? Yeah, yeah, I'm asking on average. Yeah. So we got half the class. OK. Uh, and then who here is using Less than 10% of their memory. No? Nobody? All right. So everyone here is in the category of 50% more. Oh, sorry. Uh, I should say. My bad. All right. Uh, 100%. All right. And who here is using uh, less than half their disk? Half the disk. Right, so most people, um, so if you can't find that on Windows, the trick is to open up Explorer, go to My PC, and then it will show you how much of your disk you're using. So like if you have a 300 gigabyte drive and you're using 100 gigabytes and you're using a third. If you're in Mac, you can open up a terminal and say df-h, that'll show how much in a Mac you're using of the disk. df-h is on a Mac, and on Windows, it's my PC. Look at the disk. So who here is using less than 50% of their disk? OK, so like two. That seems surprising. All right. And then who here is using 1% uh, or less of their network? Only one? OK. So. Uh, is everyone else here in the category of less than 10% of their of their network? So that means your computer talking to remote computers over, in this case, Wi-Fi. Right? That's the network. So you don't see that? Or? And I also don't understand how you add the percentage. Yeah. So, so you have a percentage of bandwidth out to the server. So when you're not sending anything, then it's at zero. Uh, yeah, that's a question. <laughs> question? Yeah. Uh, 
question? Yeah. Okay. So where I was aiming here, so this is a generic claim across all computer users who are normal. Um, so mo almost all the time, you're using very little CPU, and you're typically using a lot of memory. This is like almost always the constraint because it's the most expensive component. Most people aren't using very much of their disk. Unless they're lazy and they never throw anything away. Right? And almost no one uses their network. Right? You, if you were streaming Netflix, then you'd be using a lot of network. But most people are not always watching Netflix in class. <laughs> so why does this matter to you? You're a data scientist, right? The challenge is, at some point, you're going to be running some code against some data, and you're going to say, this is taking too long. And then you're going to go to your supervisor, and you're going to say, boss, I need more computer. And they'll say, I'm sorry, we don't have the budget. We can't afford that. You'll just have to wait. And then you'll go back to your desk very sad, because it means you're waiting and you're not being very productive. So how do you get more compute resources? As a data scientist, you have this technical skills to quantify that need. Right? So typically, you're probably going to run out of memory and disk and less occasionally a CPU. So you're going to have to be able to quantify to the people that you're requesting resources from, I've used this much memory to solve this problem. If you want me to solve a problem that's twice as big, I need twice as much memory. Right? So that's the sort of quantitative explanation that people expect from a data scientist to be able to deliver this much resources for this much problem, therefore this much resources for this much problem. That's all based on the assumption that you know how to measure the resource utilization of your computer from running a problem. Right? So we're, we profiled the code. Now we're profiling our hardware. If you can profile, I'm not using much network, therefore, don't buy me more network, right? Don't buy me more bandwidth, because I don't need it. I'm not using it. And maybe you're not using any disk, so don't worry about that part, right? But I'm typically going to use a lot of memory, so I need more memory. But this is the way that you can quantify that technical argument to say, I need more resources. Specifically, here's why it matters to the business. And I, this team can be successful if you invest with me and the hardware. That's the argument that you'll have to make. <laughs> or if you never use a computer as a data scientist, just let me know. <laughs> All right. Question. So we just profiled hardware. Does anyone have any questions on that? It's like a totally different thing for most people. Yes. Yes. Across all of your programs. Yeah. So that's right. So you really want to profile just the application you're running. Yeah. So you can do that in Task Manager. It's not very effective. Uh, you can look at how much memory an individual task is using. So back in the time series class, I actually provided a notebook to you that measures other notebooks. So it measures how much CPU and memory a notebook is taking in a notebook. And then it serves it, serves it saves it to a data frame as a pickle. So, so you can actually measure, you can instrument your notebooks using Python. And so I think a more credible way of doing data analysis against the application usage would be to do that. I'm happy to revisit that notebook because it was super fun for me to write. But. OK. So yeah, that's the normal game. All right, so now I've just convinced you can go back to your desk. I've just convinced you that you have more than one processor. No one here in this class had one processor. So now you all have to pay attention. Oh, we should take a break. Oh my goodness. It's totally break time. So we're going to have to come back. It's going to be a cliffhanger. Let's take a break and come back at 
Serial. What that really means to you is that every line gets executed in order one at a time. So that's the main idea there. But as I've been pointing out to you, this is a picture of your actual CPU, not yours specifically, but a CPU. And it has all these things called cores. And then uh, some of you have hyper threading, so that's why you actually see eight rather than four. But that's basically what a processor looks like. Hyperthreading. I don't have a good answer for that one. Okay. So I'm going to now take you down a really deep rabbit hole that's very technical, and I hope not to lose a bunch of people, but I certainly will. So I'm going to take you through a, a library called multiprocessing. All right. So this will probably result in most people getting lost. Feel bad. It's not a thing that you have to learn on the first pass. I'm not, I'm not an expert in it, so I won't claim any. Uh, deep understanding of myself. So, all right. So basically, I'm going to take advantage of this idea and the, the, the feature that there's a module with OS where I can get the process ID, so get the ID. So that's from the import OS, obviously. And so I'm asking the operating system, what is the process ID? So if this is new knowledge to you, but there. Everything that you're running on your computer is called a process. And there's a unique numeric identifier associated with that process. So, and then what's even fancier is that every process is caused by another process, which is its parent ID. So get PPID is get parent process ID. So that's basically what I'm doing here. And then I have some function that's calling another function, uh, just as I was before. So I can say this is function is calling this function, and then I can look at the process ID of both of those. So just to take you through this serial implementation of this, um, I can call the function, which is just this first one, and it's going to say this is my process ID right, for the, this cell. And then when I call this function in another cell, it's the same process. So nothing changed so far. And then that function calls the proc info function, and that also has the same process ID. So everything is being executed by one process. And then we happen to figure out that the process ID that caused all of this Jupyter kernel to come into existence was parent process 6, so not really relevant. But all of these things, even though they're in different cells and in different functions, they're all being run by the same Python kernel. So now I can uh, call, let's see, I'm going to have a, a thing called multiprocessing. So that's up here I imported process for multiprocessing. Um, and so I'm going to call that uh, inside. I'm going to call the function. I'm going to pass it the argument all within this other process. So this is now where we get off into crazy land. So I'm going to call a function. Let's see. I'm going to figure out where am I. So I, I'm currently in 2.11, as I was before. And then I'm going to start. I'm going to create a process at this line, and I'm going to call another process. So this is our first instance where we, in our Python program, have caused a new process to come into existence. So that's why this one 
it's showing that it's process ID 298, and it was created by 211, which was our original process. So that's, this is now the exciting part. You just caused a new process to come into existence from your, your current Python process. Okay. So what that allows us to do is call one process from another, and that's how we're going to get the concurrency going. We're going to create new processes. So the fun part is this pool operation. So basically, I have a pool of processors, and I want to run separate processes on those different processors in the pool. OK, so I think you guys have not seen map before. Is that correct? OK, so I'm going to take you on a quick detour. We're going to go through a couple of things, and then we'll come back to this notebook. OK, so I've primarily avoided this uh, idea of functions. Uh, like the functional approach in Python, but we're going to do a quick detour, and, and you'll probably see why pretty soon. So the first idea is called map. If you've heard of map reduce, this is the same thing. So we're doing, uh, we have a list, and then if I wanted to square each element in the list, the normal approach that I would have taught in this class is to write a for loop, iterate over all the elements in that list, and then store the results from the list into a new list. That's Relatively straightforward to understand, right? You're just saying, give me the next element, square it, put it in a new list. Give me the next element, put it in a new list, square it, right? So that's that's sort of as you'd expect, a squared set of values in a new list. But there's this crazy idea where I can define what's called a helper function. So I'm going to write a function that takes a value and squares it. Okay, so so far it's the same concept, but now we're going to apply that function that I just wrote to the list using map. And so what that's going to do is take the function and apply it to every element of the list. And it gets back to this map thing, but what we really want is a list. And so I'm going to take the map, I'm going to take this function, map it to all the elements in the list, and get a list back. And so this is the same set of values. Uh, I lost one. All right. <laughs> that's funny. I don't know how I lost it. Did I rerun it? Oh, yeah, yeah that's, that's why. Sorry, I, I lied to you. All right, list, 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 list. There we go, because I had to run it from a later cell. All right, so then the question, be, well, this is another question I was asked by another set of students is, is, is one of those faster? We'll talk about lambda functions, right? So we'll come back to that later. All right, so filter is another functional approach to, uh, let's say, applying the operation selectively. So if I wanted to uh, take only the even values out of this list and put those in a new list, then the way that I would do this with a for loop is I just iterate over all the elements, check whether they're even, and then save the results that are even. So this is modulo. OK. Alternatively, I could write another helper function, which I'll call even, and then again, apply that function to all the elements in the list, and then get a list back, and it's all the even elements. So Hopefully, you're noticing a common theme here. I have this thing that I'm going to apply a function to all the elements in the list, and I get back some result. The tricky part is, like, why would I, why would I obfuscate the code by doing this rather than write this much clearer for loop? The for loop is based on the premise that it's going to iterate through all the elements in the list one at a time. That's how for loops work. But these map and filter functions they have no sense of the order of operations. Your list could be you know, changed around in the order it is presented, and the same result would occur. Right, so order doesn't matter. That means all of the applications of this thing are independent. And so the consequence is you could do them at the same time. There's nothing saying that there's a dependence between the different iterations of the loop in this case. And so I can apply them independently. I can do them concurrently at the same time. So that's the advantage. I just want to say, somebody who has no programming background at all, one doesn't make any more sense than the other. They are equally <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I won't disagree with you on that one. OK, so reduce. And then the last one that you may have seen sometimes is called apply. So apply should get you excited. So these other ones are just like list operations. They're not super exciting. But apply, you may have seen before. And the reason you've seen it is because it is specific to pandas. So the apply is usually saying, 
do this operation to every element in the every row in the data frame or every column in the data frame. The relevance of that is, again, if you're applying a thing to every row in the data frame, they're all independent, right? There's no dependence on like the order in which you're doing them. And so therefore, you could do them all at the same time. So if I had a data frame of say, you know, four million rows and I had four processors, I could farm that out so that I get the first million rows on one processor, the next million rows on another processor and do them all independently, right? That's like a 4X speed up for my data frame. We'll see why that isn't actually the case in practice, but that's for a later discussion. Okay, so apply basically, I create this data frame, it looks like this. Then I write a little function. This is again, similar to the helper functions that we were talking about before. And I say to that data frame, apply this function on every row. Yeah, I think that's the row. I'm gonna get back a series. And so I would normally, the way that I supply is, I take uh, and assign that output to a new column. So I'm doing it every row, and then I'm creating a new column of values, and I store that in my data frame. Okay, so this should seem reasonable, because we're gonna use it later in a concurrent method against a larger data frame, and I do that split out into different chunks on different processors. Okay, yeah, apply map, okay. Between what and what? A filter usually gets you back a smaller thing than you started out with. So what we were using it, so map is just uniformly applying the same function to all the elements. Whereas, so here we started out with a list of five values, and in fact the squared of each of those elements. But filter, we're, we're typically taking something and, re, and uh, taking elements out or not, not saving all the elements back to the new list. So here, the example is, I, I don't have a good use case of like, Ben, when would you use filter in real life? I'd say I don't use it, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so a, a range is different. So a range is a generator. So a, a, the difference between a list and a generator is that a list has all the elements already populated, whereas a range does not. I'm not sure how map would apply to a range. If you want, we can do that. I do that. <laughs> let's, let's try it out. I always like doing live demos, right? All right, so let's apply this map thing to, I'm gonna, so this was the other question that I had. All right, so let's do range of five. Okay, there you go. I don't, I think it, it was probably just generating that one element at a time and applying the square function one element at a time. So I don't have any insight on the, the inner workings of range and map. Okay, hopefully that was satisfying for you. <laughs> All right, now I've, I've talked about these map things. Let's go back to multiprocessing. So now we can sort of understand what this point is, right? So I have this helper function where I'm gonna square everything. I'm gonna square all the elements of this list. And so I'm gonna call the map to do that on all these different things, except I've got this little p dot thing, right? So this is saying, I've got a pool of five processors. And so apply in the pool, the map function to all the list elements. So it's gonna spread that list operation across all the different processors and then get the results back. Okay, so that should not sound too scary, although there's a lot of things going on there. Right, the, the fancy thing is when you do try and like do fancy functions in here and then it gets crazy. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you how this works in data frames and why it doesn't work. <laughs> All right. So I've got a data frame, it's got four columns and I've got a uh, hundred rows. So this is just the first five rows of the data frame. So this shouldn't be too shocking. We've got a data frame. And then I'm gonna say that I wanna split that 100 rows of data into seven chunks. I'm gonna spread those seven chunks over four processors. So it's not gonna be a real uniform distribution, but that's just to say we can do that. And then there's some fancy stuff here. We have to split the data, data frame, and then we're gonna have to take each of those chunks, do something to the chunks, and then stitch them all back together. So this is the thing that does that, the parallelization. 
And then um, the thing that we actually want to do to each of the, um, I think, is this to the rows? Yeah, so we're going to take the A column, and we're going to multiply it by 2, and then get a new column back, K. And so think of each of that chunk. So you can do this as one giant data frame, where you just take all of the column A, multiply it by 2, and get a new column. Or you can do it chunk-wise. Okay. So then we time it so I can. I can do that, um, and I get back some 406 milliseconds. All right, so again, strip. Now let's see. Let's start at the top. Oop, and they have to skip the in first import. All right, I'll come back here. <laughs> Not a good day for me here. Mm, pool not defined. Ah. This is exciting because I did. Um, oh, I know why. That's good. <coughs> this is what I get for not running my notebook from top to bottom. So. Why is that? <laughs> yeah, well, so this is this is my troubleshooting. I had imported pool mid notebook rather than the top of the notebook, which is bad. That's bad juju on my part. Okay, so now we've got it. So df modified. That's the part where we multiplied the a column um, in chunks. Okay, so now alternatively, so th that took by the way, uh, four seven hundred forty four milliseconds to do the chunking and then stitching back together. Whereas, like this is the punchline, if I had just done that to, uh, ooh, one second, that seems high. <laughs> this is not the, not the result I was aiming for. Mm, yeah, there we go. That seems more realistic. I don't know what the, is going on with the anomalies, but so the, when I split it off and per, and concurrently operated my function on all of the chunks and then stitched back together, it took more time to do than just doing it all at once with uh, a single line. So we're doing this on one data frame, and it was way faster by a factor of like, what is that, 40? Yeah, so 40 times faster. And you're like, Ben, you just told us that running things concurrently would be faster. Does anyone have a reason why that would be a lie in this case? So it takes time to split them up. Uh, there's another factor, which is, when you split something up and you have to spread it across all these different processors, it means you have to literally send that data into memory elsewhere on the other end of the processor, do the operation, and then send it back. And so splitting it is not a huge cost, but then sending it to the other processors and then recombining it, that's overhead. And so because the data frame is so small and the operation you're doing is so easy, you'll notice most of the time is being spent in the actual uh, the processing the data to the processors. Welcome back. <laughs> okay. <Wait. laughs> we lost five and gained four. Almost equivalent. All right. <laughs> all right. So, all right. That's all I got for this notebook. So, questions on multi. I didn't actually show you a case where multi processing wins, but in practice, I have used it for large enough problems where. Um, the trick to the design is you have to send a little amount of data across the other processors and do a lot of computation in order to account for that time where you're sending data across. So don't send a bunch of data to your processors. Send a little bit, then do a bunch of processing and get a small data back. Because uh, Python, is, Python is a multi-processing library. The worst part about it is called serialization, deserialization. So basically, it has to take everything in memory compact it into this pickle format, send it across to the processors, then extract it, then do the computation, then bring it back. And so the trick to designing an eff effective use of multiprocessing is to only send a small amount of data across and then only get a small amount back. Okay. Mm -hmm. Frequently work, um, and I've never heard of this issue. 
Mm, I'm not sure how the multiprocessing is handled in R. But you, it is, so, yeah. Well, there's different ways to implement it, and it can be more or less efficient for different things, but this is not good for handling large distributions of data. So the, the better design usually is, if you have a what, like a parameters that you're trying to distribute, like I want to test out what happens when I do four of these things and six of those things, and so if you can distribute the parameters other than the data, that's more effective usually. Okay. So we just went over all the map, apply, reduce, filter stuff. So I'll skip over all that stuff. All right. So I, I showed you a thing called multiprocessing, and you'll notice that works well on your one computer. And so the problem is, if, if you have more data than fits on one computer, where do I go? Like, multiprocessing was good for using the resources you have, but if you want to get bigger, then you have to switch over to a new library, and that's called Dask. And Dask is less popular or less familiar because most people aren't doing data science on a cluster. Like, you don't own 100 computers. Most data scientists don't own 100 computers. And so that itself of having 100 computers to do data science on is a lot of work in addition to the data science part. So you, most data scientists you'll run into are running serial processes. If they have something really big, they'll use multiprocessing. But you know, if it's actually big data, they'll use Dask. All right, so why does Dask matter? Well, one good feature is it runs on your desktop. So you actually can use it um, in the environment we're used to working with. All right, and I'll skip over this, but this is basically saying that its syntax looks a lot like what you're used to with data frames. That's an intentional design. So it's leveraging the fact that you understand the pandas data frames, and it's just wrapping that out with a little bit of different syntax, but it's pretty similar. OK, and then it has some of the other functions from NumPy, so that's good. Let's go into a, a demo quick. OK, so I won't run this demo because the notebook takes like five minutes. I ran it just before class. OK, so basically install Dask. That's, that's cool. It's, it looks a little bit fancier, and it has this web interface stuff going on. It tells you all this stuff, basically because usually it's hooked up to a cluster of computers. But for our purposes, we're just running it locally on our computers. So it's telling you what the resources are, which is the same thing that we saw earlier, but now it's being reported by Dask. This was a whole like fancy Dask uh, dash, a dashboard where you can monitor the progress of things, because usually if you have like 100 computers, something's going wrong on one of them, and it's good to have the knowledge of where that is going wrong. Okay, so this should look somewhat familiar. I've got this uh, four-column data frame with now a thousand rows. All right, <laughs> so this is sort of like just walking you through the idea of I'm going to take my data frame and I'm going to convert it into a Dask data frame, so DD Dask data frame, and I'm going to do the same sort of like thing that we did before, right? Just for consistency, and then I'm going to get you to the punchline after all this good code here. So <laughs> here's the punchline. Dask is even slower than running it just on a serial process. And like, right, so, so the, the number of rows increases, the average time it takes to do those computations gets longer and longer. So you're like, Ben, you just showed us this library, which is supposed to be super fancy, and it's even worse. And you're like, yes, that's true. It's because Dask is even doing more distribution of data, and it's more administrative overhead. And so again, you won't notice any positive impacts at small scale. So in order to actually get value from Dask, you'd have to run it on a large amount of data on a large number of computers. So I'm not going to be able to show you the value of Dask other than to say, don't do it on small stuff because it's even worse than you'd normally get. Okay. So all these other things I just ran, like uh, Dask uh, and then Lambda and some other stuff. So anyways, it's worse. Yeah, I think that's all I got. So, don't use Dask on a small data frame. It's a bad idea. <laughs> That's my advice there. Okay, so why do we use it? It's because when you transition to a larger environment with actual multiple computers, you can continue to use Python. That's somewhat advantageous because it means all the analytics that you previously wrote for your small data still work on big data. So that's where it's helpful. And then there's a bunch of words up here which you probably have never seen before. That's a great thing. 
any one of these things will suck up your entire life. And so managing a cluster, that's like a full-time, literally a full-time job. So if someone says, hey, could you just set up these 10 computers? That's not the same as setting up 10 individual computers because you have to network all of them, get them all to talk to each other, authenticate, storage, it's all a mess, right? So if someone, hopefully, right, my view of the world is someone else who has an actual responsibility for a large cluster of computers will do this for you, then you show up and say, I'd like to use Dask on all your computers. And that's something they can do for you, and then you, you continue to use Python and data frames, the thing you're used to. Okay, that's how you get to big data in Python. Okay, so <laughs> all of this, um, you should never wander into optimization before you've actually done the analysis. You should always do your analysis and then have confidence that it will work in the data, and then you optimize it, right? Then you go for larger data. So start out small. All right, so I've talked about a bunch of technical stuff. Now I'm gonna transition over to a soft skill. All right. Cam thinks he knows what's coming. All right. So you're a new data scientist. You will you will leave UMBC eventually, I, I hope, and then <laughs> and then you'll be in the real world. And uh, the question for you, and we're gonna skip the poll, but so a question for you is, will your customer tell you what they want? All right. So does anyone here think that the customer can tell you the product that they're looking for? <laughs> Right, they can give you like, I want this. But that's about it. Okay, so they're definitely not gonna get you well-defined requirements. So then, the question is, if, if you're a data scientist and you're expected to produce something, how can you produce something useful for someone who doesn't know what they want? This is like the essential question to a data scientist. If you can't answer that question, you will be perpetually viewed as ineffective and you'll be wasting a lot of time. So you need to figure out how to figure out what the actual requirements for your customer are without relying on your customer to tell you because they literally don't know the answer. All right. <laughs> it, but that's every industry. I mean, it's not just data science. All right. So the, <laughs> so the trick that I have for you, this is a lesson learned for, you know, through blood loss and lots of tears, is you have to figure out who is your customer's customer. So once, once you figure out what your customer is trying to accomplish, right? who are they trying to satisfy, then you can understand the logic of what would I have to do to enable them to be successful in the thing they're trying to do. Right? Once you have that mentality and you can figure out, okay, my customer wants to do this with the product, therefore they would want this from me. That's the chain of logic here. But bad news, most organizations don't tell you that, right? What they'll tell you is this person is the boss of that person is the boss of that person. That's a hierarchy of organizations. They never tell you, as far as I've ever seen, who is the customer of which organization. Okay, so now it's on you. Your skill as a data scientist is to figure out what are the dependencies, not in software, but of organizations. All right, so the trick is you have to figure out who has the knowledge that you're looking for, and that's, again, back to soft skills. All right. So if you, who here has submitted a ticket? Right, so like uh, IT tickets, UMC, right? RT, was a retriever's help desk ticket, right? If that's the way that you gain knowledge, you will not go very far. All right, so, and the other problem is if you, do talk, if you talk to people, you will be seen as wasting their time. This was a very painful lesson for me. So in my career, I went off and I talked to a bunch of people, and then I got yelled at by their management for talking to them, which was seen as wasting their time. I was offended, because I, I, I don't waste time, right? All right, so we have an activity, maybe, somewhere near. Not this one. Where'd it go? Somewhere I have the activity. Not this one. There it is. All right, so in this game, we're gonna have a bunch of managers and data scientists. So, so who here wants to be a data scientist and who wants to be a manager? That's <laughs> Anybody wanna be a manager? 
You got a couple managers, all right. My apologies to the rest of the class. There's a manager. Let me pass that one up to another. Okay. Anybody else for manager? Okay, we've got another manager. Okay. So everybody else is data scientist, that's cool. Okay, there's one for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can be an observer. Okay. <laughs> okay, one for you. Here are scientists. Data scientist. Can I be the manager of the observer? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's a nice call, though. There you go. That one. That one. Oh man, perfect. Look at that. Okay. So once you so you now have a role. You're either a data scientist or a manager or an observer. And now I want you to fulfill your role and figure out. So if you're a manager. You have to find your team member. So managers find your team members. And then make sure that no one talks to them by distracting them, right? Your data scientist is most productive when writing Python code, right? And if someone else comes to talk to them, it means they're being distracted and they're not being productive. So managers, defend your team. OK? Who? Okay, so managers, where are you at? You got, you got your team? Okay, if you're a manager, just shout out. What are you managing? Okay, Madula. <laughs> Who is hard of engineering? Tota. Okay, if, if you're a data scientist, find your customer's customer. His manager will try and prevent you from talking to him. You have to go through the proper channels. You should talk to your management who talks to their management who talks to the data scientist.
Yeah, yeah, not everyone has a manager. Pride Pachi team doesn't have a manager? Pride Pachi team doesn't have a manager? There's only three managers right now. There's many more data scientists. Okay, so two, two more minutes. Two more minutes. Okay, let's finish up and come back to our desk. Come back to your desk. All right, so can I have a volunteer? Who who was who can volunteer? Just raise a hand. <laughs> data scientist. I need a data scientist. Okay, what was your role? <laughs> okay, and who was your customer? And who was their customer? Hardware C. Okay. Who was on the hardware sales team? I don't think they exist. Yeah. yeah. That was the problem. No. Okay, so we we have a hardware sales team. Who was your customer? 
product purchasing. And who was their customer? The user? OK. So then we need to go that direction. So who had hardware manufacturing as a customer? OK. Uh, did anyone else have any relation with any of these things? Yeah? You said hardware research? Who else? I know I had some software folks who had, as a software person, who had a relation with a hardware person. Yeah, cool. So what team were you on? The team. Yeah. You said software or what? What team were you on? What team? Software? Okay. Who had software purchasing as a customer? Yeah. Software sales. Oh, boy. Did anyone have software sales as a customer? OK. Anyone else? Which? OK, anyone that we've missed? OK. Yeah, OK, so Cam, what we're, so now we understand what the business logic is. You typically wouldn't see this. You'd see a hierarchy. So as April was commenting and reaffirming, the way that this would normally work is if you're a data scientist on a team, you don't go talk to another data scientist. You have to talk to your boss to convince them that they should go talk to that other person's boss, who would then talk to the data scientist, who would then get the information back to you in a giant meeting. right? Or worst case scenario, your boss would be not a sibling organization, and therefore they'd have to go up the chain of command and then back down the chain through some other long process. That's right. So once the approval to talk to that person, right, but none of that captures. So that is just merely interference and obfuscation of the fact that this is the actual dependency business diagram of how your business works. This is what most people never see. So your role as a data scientist is to figure out if I'm on this team, what am I doing, right? Who is who do I get stuff from, and who is depending on me? And once you understand this logic, you can design products that will amaze your customer because you'll know what they actually need to do for their customer. Okay, Cam, observations. What have you got for us? <laughs> I would say first, everybody is looking for their own customer. So they have a selfish perspective. Right. Okay. And Okay. For example, if they are looking for, let's say they are like the hardware manufacturer, and they're looking for logistics, and they probably talk to someone who is in like software um, architecture. Right. So, so it may be that not every conversation that you have with other people who are coworkers is is essentially productive. Right. However, though, uh, as the time goes by, they will get some referrals. Ah. So, Yeah, basically what you're saying, these two are connected. Your, your apparent dead ends where you were looking for information and didn't find any actually resulted in you meeting someone who later on became useful as sort of like a indirect outcome, right? So that's that building the social network. It's almost never like an immediate gratification of I needed that information, I got the information. It's more like I talked to you, it wasn't immediately useful, but it became useful. Okay, and back to, I think one of the things that you were sort of suggesting is that it looked very chaotic. Yeah, and it was, right? So it's almost never an organized, well-structured conversation among the entire workforce concurrently, or in parallel in this case. Right? And so like, you'll always see lots of meetings and emails floating by that look like it's a waste of time. That's because it is most of the time. But it's the only way that people know how to make progress. Anybody else have any other observations they want to throw in? Was it frustrating? 
Sorry? Yeah, right. I totally agree with you. So what you're, I think I'm going to rephrase what you're saying. It would be super to walk into a business where the business handed you this diagram, right? It will never exist. I guarantee it. Well, unless you're in the marketing, I mean, they will have a part like this. Hmm, okay. Well, well, I mean, <laughs> there's some database that actually tells you, like, for if you're in this industry, there, uh, which is like, so let's say the supply chain, so yep. they will like talk to you about which industry if you're in upper, upper chain or whatever. Yeah, so there's some sort of like uh, dependency management. Right. Yep. Yeah, but the social network thing is huge. Like, I mean, I've been a social security agent for about a year now. And through working in an organization, and mostly in the market, you know, the people, you'll wander into a meeting one day on an insider seat and, like, hey, I'm going to see you in the next month. All right. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how you start realizing the connection because you begin to meet up. So oftentimes they say, oh, my boss is new at the organization. I'd be like, do we know anybody in this organization? And I'll say, yes, I sure do. <laughs> Reach out through improper channels, get work done, <laughs> find out about this. So that way you have your thing. And also you can go, no, I'm so vulnerable. Yeah. So, it is so I'd say a lot of people can be dismissive of the social channels. But if you tried to run an ex organization exclusively on the hierarchical model, it wouldn't work very well. And so you have to be able to balance obeying sort of the structure of your organization, like you respect your boss's authority and their boss's authority, right? But at the same time, constantly be subverting that by going and talking to people who aren't in your organization. That's the tension, right? You're going to work in an organization where you have to balance those and you have to be respectful of the people with the power but at the same time, not rely on them exclusively. That's really challenging. OK, the other thing I was going to mention is it's stressful, right? That chaos translates to your emotional well-being not doing so well. Right? So be aware of that, because you're going to invest a lot of time in things that are not technical, and it's going to be super emotionally draining. So you got to like be cognizant of that. It's going to happen. OK, and then, so this is, hope, I'm giving you all the edge. The edge is all the other data scientists who aren't in Ben Payne's 601 class, they're not going to know what I just taught you. So they're going to look at technical things and try to solve technical problems. But you are going to be both armed in technical skills and the soft skills. So that's what my hope is for you. OK. OK. So you can, all of this is to say you could proceed without having done this exercise. But I, my claim is you'd be less effective. Right? So you want to be relevant to your customer to provide value. But they're not going to know to tell you how to provide the value. So you have to figure that out. Okay, they don't want what you want. And you, so another thing, cool thing for this little trick is that if you can provide a solution to your customer that they didn't know they wanted before they wanted it, you will look amazing. Straight up. Right? Like if, if you say, hey, uh, here's the thing I've been working on. What do you think about it? Right? And they're like, that, what? I've always wanted that, but I didn't even know to ask for it. And if you can achieve that, you are magic. OK, that's the trick. All right, so right. the other thing that this is a useful trick for is that um, there's sort of like requirements come to an organization, and then everybody does the panic scramble. Right? If, has anyone ever observed this? No. So like if I give you a homework, and you're like, oh my goodness, this is so hard. right? But if you had known that it was coming, and you had known how to solve it, it'd be not as stressful, right? So there's like an investment, an upfront investment in you being able to predict a thing has value to your organization and to you. So the way to make predictions is to know what's coming from your customer, right? Who, you're a customer of someone. If you can predict what's coming to them, then you're going to be impacted by that. And so organizational prediction is a huge sort of benefit. Again, back to the social network. Right, and then my, I think this is my last tip. So we're going to talk about cost benefit modeling in the next class. In the next class, I believe. And there, um, again, if you're just looking at your little slice of the world and you have no idea how the rest of your organization operates, you'll your cost benefit models will reflect that. And so you want to have a whole view of the organization to account for all the relevant factors. You'll only know how to do that if you know how your business operates. 
All right, so we've done a soft thing. Now we're going to go back to a couple of different sort of technical things. So if you didn't like soft skills, I my apologies for wasting your time. All right, so I've armed you with your laptop and Python. That's basically the entire class. Um, so that may not always be the right thing to do. But how do you know what, when to switch? All right, and this is, this is the standard conundrum. You're faced with a choice of either continuing with something that you know, which may not be optimal, or switching to a thing that you don't know, right? And so <laughs> this is like the, the thing that you're stuck with. You have to make that choice. There are things you know that don't work, and there are things you don't know, and you don't know how to take that risk. So your bias is always going to be to go with the thing you know. This is why organizations are slow to change. So if you've been using R for the past 30 years, you're less likely to switch because that's what you've been using. So the longer you're using a tool, the more likely you are to stick with it. That's even in the case where, like, if the new problem comes along, the first thing you're going to do is trying to attack it with the old thing you know. Okay, so <laughs> the first trick in my book is to figure out what are the choices. And so there's this handy Wikipedia page which has, oh, not that one. Uh, I wanted to pull up a different web page. Now we'll see if it works. All right. This is a funny quirk of Outlook or uh, PowerPoint. All right. So we'll go back and look at this uh, comparison of all the programming languages. Hopefully it's in here. Right. So if you've ever wondered, Ben, how many programming languages are there? There's this handy Wikipedia page. And you start out with 1C, ActionScript, Ada, Aldor, Algol, Cs, Ds, Es, Gs. Oh, my goodness. There's a long list of pages of languages, right? Each one of these, by the way, is linked to its own page. So that's cool. These are just the ones that have enough viability to show up on Wikipedia. So computer scientists have this terrible habit of, for their graduate thesis, inventing a new language. <laughs> Luckily, no one uses them, so they don't get super popular. But there's enough here that they take up a lot. So why am I showing you? <laughs> I don't have an answer for that one. All right. So <laughs> well, you just want to be concise. OK, so why am I showing you? And, and like this is Wikipedia, so I'm just wasting your time, right? The challenge is to have enough familiarity that you know why these languages would be used in different domains. So. If I tried to write an architectural program for designing a house in Python, I'd be a fool. And the reason for that is because there already exists a language for doing that, AutoCAD. Right? Does that even show up? Uh, no. OK, so there are languages that are meant for different tasks. And usually, if you're uh, solving a very different problem, then you might want to investigate whether a specific language exists for that problem. So uh, Python is not the answer for everything, right? as much as I hate to say it. All right, so there's some utility to uh, figuring out what the different domains of languages are so that you know when to switch. If you're not even familiar with these different languages, you will have no idea of whether to switch or not. So having some familiarity with what is C, C Sharp, Fortran, Python, right? All these different languages, if you can name the top 10 languages and have a little bit of reason of why does that language exist in the first place, then you're going to have an, a little bit of reason when someone presents you a problem, should I do this in Fortran? Maybe it's not worth switching. Maybe it is. OK. So popular languages are, are useful to have some understanding of. And then figuring out why domain-specific languages exist, those are helpful. And then the last one is closed source languages or proprietary languages. Languages you have to pay money for or a recurring license, my advice, stay away. Don't do that. All right. So. Again, you, you can uh, persist with the wrong tool, but it's, it's not a good thing. And so my challenge for you, if, so who here needs some paper? I guess that's the first challenge. Do I need paper? We're going to do a little bit of writing and brainstorming. There you go. Paper. Yeah. That's all I got. <laughs> I'll take your rolls back at the end of class, so don't write on those.
All right, so after you've brainstormed, you're going to keep your paper, but we're going to collect uh, the answers that you've got on your paper. No, no, no. You're keeping the paper. I'm collecting the answers verbally. Yeah. I'll give you 30 more seconds, and then we'll popcorn-style answers. All right, who has something they'd want to throw up on the board? Okay, so it takes time and there's a learning curve. I thought you were going to say fire them, but okay. So, so I heard a couple things. So, train new one, tra train existing, and then we'll keep up the firing one here. So, fire, uh, fire experience, fire the. Um, I want to say old people. That'd be a <laughs> fire the reluctant people. How about that? Absolutely. All right. So, hardware. What, so what does it mean that what is the cost associated with changing the software? Some softwares are like iOS friendly and some are only on Windows. Okay, so change of OS. Okay. Cost is it? Is that like dollars? Yeah. Of what? What are you paying for? For the new resources. New software, new hardware. Both. Both. Well, what what software cost is there? Then it's free. <laughs> so let's say some some software costs money, right? Licenses. Ooh, what? Ah, so you think why does the client not care? <laughs> All right. So maybe sometimes the customer does care. Same thing happened to us. We were working on some Java framework which was which has older version. So if we could have transferred to a newer version, it would be a faster processing. But okay, so so you're they changing. Don't want it until unless they're working. Okay, sure. So. But if you change the language, don't the people have to switch like all the languages and like on everything? So a loss of features, perhaps. Changing existing applications. That's what we're doing, yes. <laughs> okay, so we've got a couple conversations. So let's hold up. What's one thing one person wants to say? Okay. Okay, who? And there were. What was it? Why would that? Like, suppose the. The program we were using, it requires like small storage, but 
the next big switch to is requires high amount of storage. Okay, so storage, memory, CPU. Yeah. Okay, anyone else? Sure. Yeah. We, when you switch, if there, if you, the product's been existing for a long time, there's a kit of activation switch associated with all of the different versions. The version control history is going to be rendered. New documentation. Yeah. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hijack the conversation. Let's see what else we got. All right. So my favorite is new bugs. Right. In the old code, you knew the bugs. In the new code, you get to learn about the new bugs. Your customers really enjoy that process. Let me tell you. Another option, uh, yeah, so fire existing staff. Right, so, so this is like a favorite game. So usually when people switch languages, they also like to re-architect the entire program design. That's very costly in terms of time. So does everyone know, what the, so does anyone here not know what that means, re-architect, okay. So right, so let's say I've got a program that has a bunch of different functionality and the way that functionality is implemented is by a complicated sequence of function calls to other functions. So someone who's new and is like coming into the program fresh, they're going to say, this workflow looks totally complicated for these features. It would be much more efficient to just do these few things. Right? So you change the workflow in which the application works. That's called re-architecting. So the reason that happens is because the way programs work is I've got a program with a certain set of features. And then six months later, and a few more features, and the program architecture didn't change, but I've just added a little bit more cruft. And now, another six months, I add more features, and the program gets more complicated. And then after 10 years or 20 years, it looks horrendous, right? And so the natural instinct is for someone to rewrite the entire thing from scratch with a much more effective design. So that's what usually what happens. Um, then this other one, this is really expensive if you've ever hired a consultant. You may be paid $20 an hour, but the consultant gets paid $1,000 per hour, right? And you're like, Ben, how do I get to be a consultant? <laughs> yes, that is a good question. So the way you get to be a consultant is you have some specialized knowledge or some experience that other businesses want. And the reason you charge $1,000 per hour is because you may only work for five days, right? And so a consultant typically works uh, more of their time spending to find the pro projects they're working on but a consultant isn't actually hired for that long, typically, unless you're in the government, or you'd hire a, con a, a consultant for years and then miss the point, right? So, OK. Right. So all of that said, there are good reasons to change, and there are bad reasons to change. And one of the bad reasons is you've read about a news article about this new programming language, and you think, wow, this new programming language fits the problem I'm working on perfectly. That would be called hype, right? So hype is excitement, like an emotional sort of, oh man, this is amazing, right? Usually be associated with novelty. Something is new and exciting. That's why you use it, right? No, that's a bad idea. Okay, don't do that. So basically, um, there's a bunch of excitement. That's sort of like the beginning of this curve. Um, so it very, has very high expectations that it will solve everything. It will make you pizza. It will deliver all the food, right? And it will make you rich, and it will do all these great things. and be super fast and super cheap, right? So that's where expect expectations get built up. And then someone realizes, well, wait a minute, I tried it, and it didn't work for me. right? And then, th then they get sort of like frustrated. And they realize this new magical thing wasn't the thing I was promised. right? And that's, that's the trough of disillusionment. So now they've discovered that it wasn't the right product. But for a few people, it does work out. And for those people, it actually is more useful. And therefore, there's a small subset of problems where this new technology actually does work and is applicable. And so what do, what do you care, right? You're using Python 3. But <laughs> the choice you get to make is where you sit on this curve. So there's a few people who like do the early stuff. They, they, they work on only new technologies. And it's very exciting. But the problem here is things are always changing. right? You never know what's going to come in six months. You always have a job because you're learning something and you have to rewrite everything every six months. right? That's like a place to hang out. I don't recommend it too often. Then there's the people who like, uh, they see this new thing and they're willing to try it out, right? It's sort of cool, but they don't want to like put all of their business in that one new product. So you know, try it out. This is where most people hang out. Like it's it's you know, this is like if you're running Hadoop and MapReduce, you're now over here, right? People know why they're doing it. If you're in Spark, let's say Spark is like around over here, right? People are using it just because the word has been advertised a lot. That's a bad reason to use it. 
then there are people who are like, we're using Python 3 in this 601 class, right? So you're definitely over here, right? Like, <laughs> we know why we're using Python, and we know what problems it should be applied to, um, and it's not a new language. It's like 20 years old, so like that's where we are. So, But you, when you leave here, you get to make a choice. Am I going to be the one who's like constantly rewriting everything in a new language every six months, or am I going to be the person who like, sits back and waits for other people to take all the risk and the pain harm, right? The problem is, why would I sit over here? Because there might be an actual advantage to my business. So therefore, I'm willing to take some risk. So again, that's that trade-off you get to play with is, how much risk am I willing to take? And how much investment do I want to have to rewrite everything every six months? Versus there's less risk. You have to make change less often, right? All these costs happen less often here. But it also means that you're stuck in a slower, less effective language, potentially, or less effective hardware. So that's a choice you get to make. It should be a conscious choice. All right, so clean engineering hardware. And we're going to do one last uh, technical thing, and then we'll do the, the homework that you did with the cloud survey. So hardware is the same except worse as software in terms of all this stuff. So an example of this is, You've got a motherboard, you've got a, a hard drive, and some memory, and a CPU, and some keyboard monitor. So it turns out that there are companies who make hard drives, and they are constantly building new technology for you to put in your computer so that you buy a new hard drive. Right? So they typically have larger hard drives that uh, store more data and are faster to read and write. Right? So if you wanted to be on the cutting edge, you're going to have to buy hard drives every six months to keep up with that little bit of gain, right? Typically, it doesn't make sense. For memory, it's the same game. Memory manufacturers are trying to make uh, more memory capacity and charge you less. And so that might be advantageous, that you want to buy new memory every six months. Most people don't, right? Same thing for CPUs. CPUs are constantly changing. Right? They're on a tempo, and you have to buy a new processor to keep on that cutting edge. That's a cost. And if you don't pay it, you'll be stuck with a slower processor. Right, so who here has like a Pentium 4 from 1990? I do, right? So I don't need a fast computer apparently. So you could stick with old hardware. It's going to be slower and less effective, but that's cheaper and there's less work because I don't have to change my computer every six months. So again, a trade-off I get to make. So all of those same costs apply to hardware. All right, so my advice is avoid hardware at all costs. Right, and what I mean by that is like start out with paper and pencil. If you can avoid a computer, you've invested hundreds of dollars in something else besides a computer. Definitely do that. If you can solve problems on paper, do that. So then once you've switched to a computer, use your laptop, right? It's the default computer. And then, so this is like a big one. When you have an application that doesn't fit on your computer, the first trick is to optimize it so that it does fit on your computer. Don't immediately think of going to a cluster. Clusters are really painful, and they're hard to set up and hard to maintain. They have lots of bugs, and you don't want to use them unless you have to. And so the first thing to do is, if your computer works, use your computer better. Then, once you've shown that yeah, I've optimized it, it's fully as fast as it could be, as small as it could be, then you go to the larger computers. OK, that's my life advice. <laughs> All right. Right, so there's lots of things you can change besides hardware. Hardware is very expensive. Don't change it. Switch to other things like your software and your algorithms. OK, has anyone here used the GPU? I think some of you should have say yes. Get a one yes. No one else has used the GPU. OK, so if you're in 602, is who's here in 602? And they haven't used the GPU yet? All right, I'll talk to them. All right, so. Typically, you're doing your programming with your CPU, your central processing unit. In deep learning, when you're running like a large uh, neural network, you may end up using your GPU. And the reason you do that is because a lot of the math can be done concurrently on a GPU. It's dense linear algebra. So you're just doing a bunch of multiplies concurrently. That's what GPUs do. That's why your neural networks, which are dense linear algebra, can be done on a GPU effectively. So that's why you'd want to switch over to that. But the problem is most people don't have a need for deep neural networks, and you're not going to use a GPU. So having all that expensive hardware doesn't gain you anything. So you have to have some understanding of why am I using a GPU in the first place? 
if the problem I'm using doesn't need a GPU, don't use it. Okay, so the fact that no one here is using a GPU is sort of weird. Okay. All right, and now to the homework, or sorry, not the homework, the, uh, the cloud. So, right, this is, <laughs> I have to say everything is my favorite, but this one is definitely a favorite. So <laughs> you went off and did a survey on my behalf. I totally appreciate the work you did. I am grateful. The funny thing is, look at how much variation is for the results that you found. <laughs> All right, so so observation number one in my book, there, there's a range here, right? Yeah? Also, there's a huge range between suppliers. So like Amazon versus Google versus Microsoft, they have huge variations, right? So Google, not so much, which I was sort of impressed by. I don't know if that's because you all went to the same website or what, but not so much. But between Amazon at, was that, $130,000 versus $23 for Microsoft, that's quite a spread. Okay. It gets worse, right? So like, here we have Amazon at $162,000, $160,000 for the year, uh, and then, what are these, like 300000 so like, up in the tens of thousands of dollars down to like $2,000 for Microsoft. Like that's still quite a spread. And you'd think for more storage, you'd have more consistent numbers, but all right. So anybody have any questions about why that would be? All right, so we, we noticed that there's a weird spread that nobody, almost none of these are repeat values, right? So like there's, yeah, there's two values for Google that are the same, and I, yeah, so, so why would that, why would a business be motivated to hide their prices from the customers? No, <laughs> I have asked that, and that's not the case. So they're all displaying the same thing. The problem is, if you wanted to know how much, you know, Basically, it comes down to the question of, should I use A or should I use B, right? As a customer, you're going to have to answer that question, which service should I use? And so they, I think this is the case, they intentionally make it not clear so that you can't do a comparison. So this is their way of, like, you actually have to just get on the system and use it and then get a bill and then say, oh, that's how much it costs. By that time, what have we done? We switched our hardware, we switched our software, Right, you've got all of your investment tied up in that platform. Yeah, okay, now I know what it costs, but I also did a bunch of work, and I don't want to switch to another platform to figure out what that other platform costs. Yeah, so you say, well, why not just write the same analytic on Microsoft and Google and Amazon? That's three times the amount of work, right? And I have to have a concurrent experiment running at the same time on all three platforms. That looks really expensive, right? And so this gets down to the hype of like, you know, who has the better advertising? Which one are you going to try out first? Right, which one looks least risky, and then you'll probably stick with that one because the hardware and software switching cost is really high. Okay, that's one thing. So now we've got compute. So um, again, this was for 20 processors, five CPUs, and a terabyte of RAM, right? So again, there's quite a spread. I tried to order these, uh, and so up from $240,000 down to like uh, $1,400 for a computer. Right? And this is, these aren't unreasonable questions, by the way. So like when you say, hey, my boss, I need a computer on the cloud. And they're like, great, go get one. How much will it cost you? And you're like, I have no idea. <laughs> but that's the conversation you're going to have. Same thing for a storage. I need to store a terabyte of data. Totally sounds like a reasonable statement. How much is it going to cost you? I have no idea. <laughs> They're trying to hide their pricing so that you have to use their platform in order to figure out how much it costs. And But at the same time, they have to be able to tell you, they have to be able to check mark the box and say, we told you what the cost was, right? But if you did this experiment 25 times, which we did, Right, you'd see, oh, that's not a consistent report. 
Not that it's a, everyone provided an answer. It's that it wasn't consistent. That's the point. Okay, this is one of the hopefully another obvious point is that it is very cheap usually to get data into the cloud. Very expensive to get data out of the cloud. Again, this is called vendor lock-in. So the point is, if you put data in the cloud and it's free, you're like, great, I don't get a bill. That's amazing. But then you're like, wait a minute. If I wanted to switch to another platform provider, what would I have to do? Get the data out of the cloud and put it on the other place. When, in which case, I have to pay, apparently, uh, no, $12,000 to get my data out of the cloud. That's the switching cost, right? So this is this should like so whenever a total who here has heard the phrase total cost of ownership? Okay, one. All right. So if you're not familiar with total cost of ownership, this is the idea that you will own the problem from start to finish. So you have to create the data, you have to get the data, you have to create the data, you have to upload the data, you have to analyze the data, you have to download the result, you have to clean up, right? You have to do all the legal compliance issues, you have to support the computers. There's a whole bunch of things in data science you have to do. And so each one of those aspects costs money. And so what they're doing here is they're hiding the cost of getting the data from you because they want to keep it in their cloud. So when you have to think of it holistically, what's the entire life cycle? It's not just me writing some Python code. It's how do I get the data into the cloud? How do I do the analysis in the computer? How do I get the data back down? All these things matter. So if you're only accounting for just, oh, you know, look how cheap it is to run my computer. That wasn't the goal, right? The goal is you have to understand the cost of the entire workflow. All right, and then for the sort of grins, um, there were five people who had self-hosted as a, as a solution. And so <laughs> one thing that's sort of like straightforward, so there's a huge variation here among the cloud providers, right? And then basically the variation for these five people was between $8,000 and $40,000. So that's a reasonably, a, in my opinion, a smaller range. The hidden cost here is I just ask for details about hardware. And the hidden cost on this side is the maintenance. So you have to hire a system administrator. You have to pay for your own heating and cooling. Maybe you have a room that you have to pay rent on. So there's a couple other factors that are not present here. Electricity, Electricity absolutely. So and if you have water-cooled servers, you got to pay for water. So there's other costs here, right? It's physical security. So if you want to really be holistic, you have to say, I don't want random people walking into my data center. Therefore, I have to buy a guard or a security camera or something. Right? So again, if you're trying to account for the total cost of ownership, just the hardware is an incomplete picture. <laughs> this is the essential question of like, if I add up the cost of the system administrator and the security and the physical premise and the electrical power and the heating and air conditioning, all that stuff, is that a lower cost than paying Amazon for the cloud, right? And it really, the answer to me, it comes down to, you know, your, your use case, like how much data are you moving? What type of compute do you need? Is it for short term? Like if I'm a data scientist and I needed to do a project for two weeks, then it totally does not make sense to buy hardware because then I have a five year hardware cost to amortize. But typically a data scientist is doing things in like week or two week bursts. In which case, maybe you want to size the the problem to the hardware, and then that variability, the elasticity of a cloud is helpful. Whereas if I bought a computer, it's just that one size. So it, it really depends. To me, the answer depends on the problem you're trying to solve. Okay. Now, someone who's way smarter and more detail oriented than I am went off and analyzed all of the cloud cost. So this should be a useful chart for you. If someone asks you, how much will it cost to do X in the cloud? This is the chart I would recommend turning to because basically, and this is, uh, I think, for Amazon. Yeah. So basically, they're saying like every time you move data or do a compute or use some service, that's going to cost you some money. And so they, they calculate out all these different services and data movements cost you how many cents, right? And then you could figure out what the cost is of all that. That's way more details than you need to know for this class, but in the future, if someone asks you, you know, what it will it take to do this, this is where I would turn. Okay. So then I think this is a little last tangent here is you'll notice there are a lot of like AI tools uh, for each of the cloud providers, right? So like 
Amazon is now advertising a bunch of like built-in data sources on their cloud. Uh, Google has TensorFlow, obviously, and they have all these TensorFlow classes for free. Isn't it amazing that these people who are selling products happen to be selling training for a product that you'd have to use on their cloud? Okay, that's, that's like a connection you should make. They're not actually offering free training. They're trying to get you to buy into the platform because the only place that you typically use TensorFlow is on Google's. Right, so you have to think about why are they offering free training on a really complicated topic? It's because they want to use their software. All right. Okay, that one I don't have. Homework I do have. All right. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. You don't actually think this is the only homework, do you? Is there another one? Wait, wait. No, there isn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go. Oh man, you guys are like a roller coaster tonight. <laughs> uh, no, there's two more classes. This is class 13, there's 14 and 15. Okay, so I'm giving you this time to read this, and then we have six minutes in which you can ask questions and say, Ben, how would you do this homework? Like all the good questions, right? So we're going to do the same assignment again. Did you make it faster? So, my, my, uh, yeah. so I had a proposal for you guys. So, so this would be option one. I wanted to get run this past you. Uh, do you remember homework number one? What was that one? <laughs> huh? wow, th it was the yeah yeah so so my my thought is uh, you wrote either a written description or a Python notebook that simulates your grade right remember that one so so my thought is you could choose to either do this one or reimplement that uh, that first assignment as like ignore the timing part, just re-implement that assignment, but simulate the grade that you think you'll get if you randomly choose a certain number of assignments. Right? Does that make sense? So like you'd run the same, so let's say you've got 30 homeworks, right, and you choose some number of them, and then you'd get a grade based on that calculation, right, from the rubric. But if you rerun that with a different random selection, you get a different grade. So on average, what grade would you get? Yeah. Yeah, that I haven't fixed yet, so. <laughs> but does anyone have any thoughts on that? Would that sound like an interesting homework? Because I think th if I were in your position, I would want to be able to predict what my grade was going to be so I could either feel comfortable or panic, one of the two. <laughs> right? And so I think there's some value in having you calculate what your like maximum highest grade was, maybe what your lowest possible grade is, what the average grade is over many calculations of that random selection of the grades. Does that make sense? So I think I will, this is going to be option number one. You can do this one or the thing I just described. So for option two, does that work? Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Does that make sense? No, 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 no. Yes, yeah. You could use some of them. That's those are options, yeah. That's on a, on a previous assignment. But it, like, you know, the last previous, like, one of your assignments took five minutes, then you rewrote it and it became shorter. Yeah, yeah. Can't ever ask questions. That's, 
then you're done. <laughs> <laughs> I will think I'll take that information. Okay, Cam and then Ah. <laughs> okay, so we had a question about RAM disk. So this is going to be a fun little detour for you guys. Has anyone here worked with a RAM disk before? Okay. Yeah. So so RAM disk are magical. So basically the idea is your hard drive is either an SSD or a spinning disk, a platter, right? And on the previous homework with the scaling, you were writing data from memory to disk. Now, the reason that you would do that is because memory is fast but small, and disk is slow but large. And so typically, when you're saving data, and it's a large amount of data, you save it to the disk. But a RAM disk is special because it allows you to use your RAM as storage. And so this, again, I'm not going to go into the technical details about how to implement one, but for both Windows and Linux and Mac, you can take part of your memory, which is fast and small, and say, I'm going to use 8 megabytes of that as storage. And so if you've never actually experienced the joy of this, if you run your com entire computer out of RAM, it is lightning fast. Like, you don't notice it very much because, like, you'll click on an application and, like, it pops up within a half second. But if it pops up faster than you've ever seen before, right, that's like a really cool experience. So RAM, running your computer on a RAM disk is very cool. But. Exactly. That's right. Right. Yes. It is only as lasting as long as your computer's on. And you have to remember to run the data out of RAM disk to disk before you shut down your computer. But so that, that's like a pretty technical uh, thing that I wouldn't advise everyone in the class to do, but it's definitely a fun thing to do. Sorry? The, the processor cache is different. There's the processor cache, then memory, then your disk. But you can't store things in cache. It's too small. Lambda functions were not covered? No, I thought you said you were going to cover today. I think I had a nope. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lambda. Yeah, I have a notebook, so it'll be posted in Blackboard. Yeah. Thank you. I'll take back your name tags and your roles for the for the game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So you have to you have to make a guess about like what do I think my score will be on the final project and these homeworks that are coming up. So it's going to be a random selection from the scores you have and the scores you think you'll get. Okay. Okay. Uh, if I am searching in open multiple, it means I have it outside. Uh, command the two data sets, it's like total 10 columns and okay. 1,000. Sounds good. No, I'm asking you. It's different, it's different data sets, but yeah. by command, both the data sets we have. The, the 10 columns, 1,000 rows is applicable to your combined data. Yes. Okay, with the two data sets, it should be covered. Yes. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> okay, so I wanted to ask, like, I'm still confused about the data set. Like, for, for your final project. project. Yeah. Okay. So for the population, I'm, I'm 